You're listening to True Crime Feed. Welcome to True Crime Feed. I'm your host, Angela Ferrari, reviewing the best true crime podcast from the past decade with a teensy bit of humor, plus my top three true crime picks of the week. Today on the docket, we have the case of Martha Moxley, a murder that occurred on Mischief Night, Halloween Eve in 1975. And to take your listening experience to the next level, go to thetruecrimefeed.com and sign up for my newsletter where I curate visual aids to accompany the show. It's a little bit of a 1970s party in there this week. You'll see immediately from the photos, Martha was really cool, a vibrant girl from a place with the type of wealth only a very few out there can imagine. I first heard about this murder when I was digging into the history of the notorious Elon School for Troubled Teens, located in my home state of Maine, and discovered the prime suspect in this case was an alumnus. So when I was looking for a quick overview of the crime, I turned to the podcast Crime Junkie. This show is hosted by Ashley Flowers and Britt Praywatt. Flowers launched the Audio Chuck True Crime Podcast Network back in 2017, and it's become a juggernaut in the true crime world. I know folks out there have opinions about Ashley and Britt. If you're familiar with their work, you know right away if Crime Junkie is for you or not. Britt and Ashley are very earnest and open with their emotions, and for me growing up in an Italian, Irish Catholic household, my people can have difficulties connecting with and reciprocating these kinds of upfront, sincere feelings. However, we are amazing in bar fights. So Crime Junkies isn't my perfect soul match show, but I did spend a lot of time listening when it first came out. It was a gateway for me into many true crime cases. And even though I'm not a regular listener now, I have fond nostalgia for my Crime Junkie road trip binges, especially their introspective coverage of the case of Martha Moxley. Ashley and Britt do a nice job keeping things on track between the lines because this is an easy one to veer off course. Like me, you might be tempted to explore the many detours and find yourself getting completely lost in it. A case that can eat away at you. You'd give anything to know the answer. So, let's start with what we do know. First things first, the 1970s sounded awesome, especially if you were a rich kid growing up in Belhaven, Greenwich, Connecticut. This was one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country, an Oceanside neighborhood with the grandest of estates, just 40 minutes outside of New York City. Martha Moxley's family relocated from California to Greenwich, Connecticut in 1974 when she was just 14 years old. For most teens, this age can be quite awkward. A time when you are trying to figure out yourself, maybe playing around with some different looks. Uh, Personally, I made the mistake of thinking giving myself bangs was a good idea. Uh, Spoiler alert, it wasn't. I cut my bangs way too short and they were super bushy. So for a good three weeks, I was walking around school with Ron Swanson's mustache on my forehead. Until, mercifully, they grew out long enough where I could twist them up into a zazzy butterfly clip. Absolutely brutal. So I am in awe of Martha Moxley, a beautiful, vibrant California beach blonde. At age 14, left all of her old friends behind in the West Coast and managed to make fast friends right away at her new school in Connecticut. She was voted most popular girl after being enrolled in just nine months. And I know it's a trope to overly idolize a young murder victim, but real talk, Martha sounded like a remarkable person. That perfect balance of smart, athletic, artistic, and cool. She was the kind of girl that could go out one night, smoking, drinking, having a blast with friends way past curfew. Then the next night, enjoy a quiet evening at home with her family, writing and sketching in her notebook, and playing with her cat, Tiger. 
Plus, uh, I hate to be this vapid, but dude, her hair game was on point. Martha Moxley had this timeless, quintessential American girl look to her, like they'd sing about in those old rock songs. A truly captivating human being, full of promise, Martha's life ended at the hands of a ruthless killer. It was the night of Thursday, October 30th, 1975. Martha was now 15 years old, and she was supposed to be grounded that night, but her dad was out of town on a business trip, and her mother, Dorothy, granted her permission to go out and have some fun with her neighborhood friends in Belhaven on what was referred to as Mischief Night. A wild, raucous night for teens where they'd commit these naughty little pranks, some picturing egg throwing, pumpkin kicking, toilet papering houses, ding dong ditch, anything that would garner the reaction of get off my lawn. Actually, this is rich Connecticut turf, so it would have sounded more like get off my lawn that I just had seeded with zoysia grass, you derelicts. More like that. Mother Dorothy was expecting Martha home around 10-ish, but it looked like she was breaking curfew again. Dorothy dozed off for a while and then woke up at 2 to find that Martha still had not returned home. Now Dorothy was really worried. She phoned Martha's close friend, Sheila McGuire, who hadn't seen Martha but really wasn't worried because again it was mischief night. She figured Martha probably fell asleep at a friend's house. But Mother Dorothy had a bad feeling. By the time 4 a.m. came and still no sign of Martha, Dorothy called the police. The Greenwich PD responded right away, and this is about the only thing they did correctly when it comes to the Martha Moxley case. At first, they're just looking for a possible runaway teen around the area. They weren't suspecting anything more than that. After retracing Martha's steps that night, they learned she had been spotted at her neighbor's, the Skakels. All right, a word about the Skakels. These people were loaded. A legacy family who built a coal empire. Grandfather George Skakel started the Great Lakes Carbon Corporation back in the 1920s. By the end of the decade, he was a multimillionaire. A multimillionaire in 1920s money. That's a whole lot of Lucky Strike cigarettes and Old Forester whiskey, daddy-o. Grandfather George and his wife Ann Skakel died in a plane crash in 1955, leaving their estate to their seven children, which included Rushton Skakel, now neighbor to the Moxleys in Belhaven. Rushton had seven kids of his own, and in addition to being from an uber-wealthy family, Rushton's sister Ethel married Robert F. Kennedy, the former presidential candidate, attorney general, and brother of President John F. Kennedy. And Robert was assassinated in 1968, but not before having 11 children with his wife, Ethel. There's so many Kennedy kids, you guys. So Rushton Skakel's children were cousins with Robert and Ethel Kennedy's children. And Rushton's wife died of cancer in 1973. Then the father struggled with alcohol and became absent with his children. So you have a mess of unsupervised kids with an unlimited budget. What could go wrong? On the night of October 30th, 1975, Father Rushton was away on a hunting trip, leaving his children to their own devices. The Skakel home had a reputation of being the party house. We all knew that house growing up. Even if you stayed home and played with your erector set, you still heard about wild underage parties and shenanigans at that notorious classmate's house. Tommy and Michael Skakel were those classmates for Martha. Their house was the place you could smoke, drink, hook up, even engage in the occasional fist fight. A total free-for-all. Even though Martha was the same age as Michael, she was actually closer buds with Tommy, who was 17 at the time. Though it was clear to everyone in their group that Tommy wanted to be more than friends with Martha. Martha wrote in her diary that Michael Skakel warned her to stop leading his brother Tommy on if she wasn't interested. In another entry, about a month before her murder, she wrote that Tommy was being annoying, constantly trying to put the moves on her. She even referred to him as an a-hole. And in reference to the Skakel house, Martha also wrote, quote, I really need to stop going over there. 
but that's where Martha was last seen the night of her death. Tommy Skakel told her mother Dorothy over the phone he hadn't seen Martha since she left his house around 9.30 p.m. And by sunup the morning of Halloween, friends, family, and the police were scouring the neighborhood searching for Martha. Friend Sheila McGuire discovered her body. And it's one of the most horrific crime scenes you can imagine. I don't usually like to go into graphic detail if I can help it, but the particulars of this crime scene are very important. But feel free to fast forward the next 30 seconds if you're not up for it, though. So around noon, October 31st, 1975, the day after she went missing, Martha Moxley's body was discovered under a tree in her backyard. It appeared as though she had been dragged from her driveway to this location. Martha's pants and underwear had been pulled down, and the brutal manner of her death was clear right away. She had been beaten with a six-iron golf club, so violently that the club broke into several pieces. Then she was stabbed with the broken club. A piece of the golf club shaft was found sticking out of her neck. However, the leather grip of the golf club was missing from the scene and to this day has never been recovered. Martha's head and hair were so covered in blood, you couldn't tell she was even blonde. It's hard to imagine the most hardened, violent criminal being capable of this, let alone one of Martha's teenage classmates. But that's where the police investigate first. The golf club murder weapon matched a custom set that had belonged to the late mother Anne Skakel. And it just so happened this six iron club was missing from the golf bag. So that brings the investigation to the Skakel house. Neighbors of the Skakels recalled hearing dogs barking and a possible girl screaming around 10 p.m. that night. Little brother Stephen Skakel, who was nine years old at the time, told his friend on the school bus the next morning that he woke up in the middle of the night because he heard a lady screaming or maybe laughing. He told his friend this on the bus before Martha's body had been found. Father Rushton rushes home from his hunting trip, and when questioned about the golf clubs, he brushed it off saying his kids and their friends were always playing pitch and putt around the yard and were known to leave the clubs scattered around outside. Anyone in the area could have stumbled upon one and used it to kill Martha. Both Tommy and Michael gave their alibis to the police right away. Here is what investigators had pieced together so far. Martha had been out with her friends Helen and Jeffrey, spelt with a G. They go over to the Skakel house around 8.45 and meet up with Michael and Tommy in the driveway. They blast some groovy tunes out of the Skakel's Lincoln car. Then older brothers Rush Jr. and John Skakel meet up with them in the driveway. The Skakel's cousin Jimmy had been over for dinner that night and they needed to bring him home. So little brother Michael Skakel's alibi is that he rode off with his older brothers to drop off cousin Jimmy at his house about 40 minutes away. While at Jimmy's, they all watched Monty Python until he returned home around 1130 and immediately went to bed. Tommy Skakel stayed behind and was hanging out with Martha, Joffrey with a G, and Helen. There was suspicion that Tommy had been drinking that night. Accounts that Martha and Tommy were being flirty. Tommy kissed her. The last sightings of Martha were around 9.30 p.m. When Martha and Tommy were seen stumbling around together by the fence near the Skakel pool house. That's when friends Helen and Geoffrey say they left. Tommy said he watched Martha head down the street shortly after and then spent the rest of the evening home watching the film The French Connection with his new live-in tutor, 25-year-old Kenneth Littleton, after the movie ended with one of the best car chases ever captured on film. Tommy said he and tutor Kenneth were up late working on a history report about Abraham Lincoln. Though later, when his teachers were questioned about said homework, none of them had heard of any Abraham Lincoln history report. So either Tommy didn't understand the assignment, or he was lying. As for tutor Kenneth Littleton, when I say he was new, I mean that quite literally. He'd just started working for the Skakels and moved in that day. 
Pretty crazy, right? Only a few hours on the job before this crime occurred, though he wasn't officially questioned until the summer of 1976. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, this case was bungled with a capital B. As awesome as the 1970s were, DNA slash evidence collection practices weren't great at that time, especially in Greenwich, Connecticut, where the police department hadn't had a murder in their jurisdiction in over 30 years. So it's understandable that they'd make some dumb mistakes. For example, after Martha's body was discovered, they left it unattended, the crime scene unsecured for hours. And meanwhile, a neighborhood dog had trampled through and disturbed the scene. There was also no medical examiner in town available to perform the autopsy right away. So they needed someone from the state to conduct the autopsy. And instead of being transported by a member of law enforcement, the body was delivered to the ME lab by a private funeral director. Because of all this, the autopsy was delayed a few days, so a lot of the findings were inconclusive. Time of death was roughly determined to be between 9.30 p.m. to 5 a.m. on the night of October 30th. And even though her pants were down, there appeared to be no sign of sexual assault though it looked like there were bloody handprints on her inner thighs, which points to the crime being sexually motivated. So the police have their suspicions, but not enough direct evidence to charge anyone with the murder of Martha Moxley. And her case goes cold for 15 years. That is until a series of truly bizarre events will eventually land one man in prison. In 1991, William Kennedy Smith was in the news, accused of rape and going on trial in Florida. William Kennedy Smith was another Kennedy cousin. The press was having a field day with him. There was media speculation that maybe he was in Greenwich the night Martha Moxley was killed and maybe he was the one who did it. No, this theory gets quickly squashed. William Kennedy Smith did not kill Martha. He wasn't in Greenwich that night. He's barely even related to the Skakels. But at this point, the Moxley case is back into the national spotlight. There was a piece written back in 1982 by the infamous crime reporter Len Levitt, a scathing expose about the Greenwich PD's mishandling of the murder case. The piece was so scathing, in fact, that the local papers refused to run it at the time. But in 1991, the New York Post uncovered the Len Levitt report and ran it in their paper. For the past 15 years, there had been tons of rumors in the town of Greenwich that Tommy Skakel murdered Martha, or maybe even that Tudor Ken Littleton was the culprit all along because his life went downhill fast after the murder of Martha Moxley. Some wondered perhaps if his struggles with drugs, alcohol, and mental health were all a result of a guilty conscience. But over the past decade and a half, None of this speculation ever made it past the rumor mill phase. But thanks to the finger pointing at William Kennedy Smith, the case was now garnering attention once again. The DA reopened the Martha Moxley murder case in 1991, and a new prime suspect emerged, younger brother Michael Skakel. Michael also struggled after the Moxley murder. He was arrested for a DUI in 1978, and instead of going to prison, Michael Skakel was sent to the notorious Elon School in Poland, Maine. If you don't know about this place, I did a two-part episode covering the horrific abuse many students at this school suffered. Michael was no exception. The staff was privy to his wealthy background and possible connection to the Moxley murder, so Michael was forced to wear a sign around his neck saying, confront me about the murder of Martha Moxley. Michael was subject to ring fights where one by one he had to box fellow students until he submitted to their will. At the Elon School general meetings, fellow students would berate him, accusing him of killing Martha. So it was at this school under these conditions Michael supposedly confessed to murdering Martha Moxley. After he, quote, graduated from Elon, it took him a while, but Michael seemed to get his life together. 
He was diagnosed with dyslexia at the age of 26 and became sober in his 20s as well after he had struggled with drugs and alcohol since the age of 13. He went on to become a professional speed skater, got married, and had a child. But in 1991, his Elon School confessions from the 1970s were in the news. And scrutiny was back on the Skakel family. So Father Rushton hires a private investigation firm called Sutton Associates to do their own examination and hopefully clear his son's names. This totally backfired, mainly because the Skakel boys' stories changed. And now we've reached the part of the show I'm going to reluctantly call The Very Pervy Adventures of the Skakel Brothers. Colin, why are teenage boys so disgusting? All right, so again, it's 1991, and Tommy is now saying the night of the murder, after his friends Jeffrey with a G and Helen left, Martha didn't go home right away at 9.30 as he originally stated. Instead, Tommy said that he and Martha went to second base on themselves, i.e. mutual masturbation, and that she left closer to 10 p.m., and that could maybe explain why her pants were down. I still don't get this. Is Tommy saying that after they finished getting handsy, Martha kept her pants down and hopped home potato sack race style, then happened to come upon some other rando in her driveway who ended up killing her? It makes zero sense to me. Things are about to get even weirder because Michael now claims that after he returned home from watching Monty Python at Cousin Jimmy's house, instead of going right to bed like he originally said, Michael admits to being high and drunk and wandering around the neighborhood. He said he climbed into a tree near what he thought was Martha's bedroom window and tried to wake her up by throwing rocks. When he didn't see any sign of her, he hung out in the tree for a little while longer and masturbated. I know, this whole Sutton Associates saga is so bizarre. I don't really know what to make of it. Why would the Skakel boys change their stories and admit to such pervy behavior? The whole Sutton investigation, just a weird detour. And these files were supposed to be speculative scenarios, possible cases that could be made against Tommy, Michael, and Tudor Kenneth. But somehow these findings got leaked to reporter Dominic Dunn. Dunn was a huge true crime reporter back in the 90s. He was known for his famous articles in Vanity Fair, covering everything from the O.J. Simpson case, the Menendez brother trial, the rape trial of William Kennedy Smith. And then he also wrote a fictional novel about the Moxley case called A Season in Purgatory. He changed the names of everyone involved, but it was super obvious who was who in the story. And then, you guys, guess who shows up and wants to make the case all about him? Ex-LAPD cop Mark Furman. Yeah, that Mark Furman. The dude who testified in the O.J. Simpson case and let's just say didn't make a great witness for the prosecution. Furman's public image was in desperate need of a makeover. And he became chums with Dominic Dunn through the O.J. Simpson case. Dunn encouraged Furman to do his own investigation into the murder of Martha Moxley, and he gave him all the intel he had from the leaked Sutton Associates private investigation. In 1998, Furman claims he solved the case. And guess what, you guys? He wrote a book, too, called A Murder in Greenwich, where he accuses by name Michael Skakel of the murder of Martha Moxley based on Michael's, quote, confessions. That same year, a super rare one-man grand jury decided that, yep, between his changing story given to the Sutton private investigation firm and the confessions made at the Elan School for Troubled Teens, there was enough evidence to charge Michael Skakel with the murder of Martha Moxley. Okay, and here's where we start to get into a bit of a legal pickle. The crime occurred when Michael was 15, so even though he's 41 at the time of the trial, technically he should maybe be charged as a juvenile, but a judge rules that he should be tried as an adult. In his defense, Michael's attorney puts famous forensic expert Henry Lee on the stand to explain the lack of physical evidence to tie Michael Skakel to the murder. 
Henry Lee later includes his experience investigating the case in his 2003 book, Cracking More Cases. As for the prosecution, they parade various eyewitnesses from the Elon School onto the stand to give testimony about Michael's confessions. A former Elon student who originally gave his testimony to the one-man grand jury, he died from an overdose by the time Michael's trial rolled around. But prosecutors played an audio tape of his testimony, which of course could not be cross-examined. Also, I forgot to mention that Michael Skakel was also trying to write his own book and had recorded audio tapes of himself for said book proposal. These audio tapes were obtained by the Greenwich Police Department when he was arrested and it was used against him at trial. They played a series of short audio clips and overlaid the recordings of Michael with photo slides of the crime scene for the jury. And based on this evidence, Michael was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years. In 2003, Michael's cousin, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., writes an article in The Atlantic in defense of his cousin. And guess what, you guys? He also writes a book, too, called Framed. RFK Jr. helps in the effort to overturn Michael Skakel's conviction, which went all the way to the Connecticut Supreme Court. At first, they deny his appeals, and then this whole post-trial legal pickleball game goes back and forth for 10 years. Until 2013, Judge Thomas Bishop grants Michael Skakel a new trial. And while he's out on bond awaiting his new trial, the Connecticut Supreme Court reinstates his conviction in 2016. And in 2018, his bail is revoked and Michael is sent back to prison to resume his sentence. But then he's granted a new trial again. And in 2020, the chief state attorney said he wouldn't retry Skakel because he thought that there wouldn't be enough evidence to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So Michael Skakel goes free. As of 2023, Michael is suing the Greenwich PD for the audio recordings from his book proposal. And the family of Martha Moxley still maintains that Michael Skakel was the true murderer of their beautiful daughter. And after all of this, I still don't know. Even if I read every single book written about this case and started my very own Martha Moxley book club, I still wouldn't have an answer for you. Because real justice for Martha is finding her killer based on direct physical evidence. And we just don't have that here. And it only adds to the tragedy if you wrongfully point the finger and convict someone else of a crime they didn't commit. And like I said at the beginning, this case will eat away at you because it feels deceivingly solvable. Like a jigsaw puzzle you can't complete because the cops left it outside unattended and then some mischievous dogs trampled through and chewed up the last few pieces. But here's what I'm comforted by. We've come a long way, baby. Evidence collection, chain of custody, forensic testing, and frankly, true crime content have all improved drastically. Next time someone calls you a basic B for being obsessed with your murder stories, just tell them you're preparing yourself for potential future jury duty. The more of us out there who are in the know will shape how police conduct their investigations. Cases solely based on dubious confessions are a lot less likely to get a conviction. The detectives who understand the assignment will know we want to get physical evidence. And that was the case of Martha Moxley. I can't believe this one is almost 50 years old. And after revisiting it, I am now feeling inspired to write a book of my very own, all about other true crime books. Kind of like what I'm doing with this podcast about other podcasts, but with books. I will revisit classics from the 80s, 90s, and early aughts and occasionally roast them. Yes, I'm joking, but also I kind of think that would work. I'll start recording my audio for the book proposal now. And in the meantime, tell me what you think about the Martha Moxley case. You can email me directly at Angela at the truecrimefeed.com or join the True Crime Feed Facebook discussion group. Keep an open mind and be kind to fellow true crime feed friends.
Stay tuned till after the break to hear my top three podcast power ranking of the week. Hey, True Crime Feed listeners, I have a teensy little ask of you. I need your help to grow my audience so I can keep the stories coming. So I'm asking you to take a moment and share True Crime Feed with five friends you think will enjoy the show. Like a fun, awesome pyramid scheme, but you still get to hang on to your money. Cool. And if you want extra gold stars, go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for True Crime Feed. I am an independent one woman show, and you taking a moment to do this will help me grow and compete with the big networks out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now back to the show. And we're back. Before we start the ranking, you guys, I'm such a feeb. I was anticipating another episode from Murder in Apartment 12, but episode six was the last one, which makes sense. They wrap things up pretty good. But I was really wanting more Keith taking the investigators to task. I'm very excited about his new show, Morrison Mysteries, but I'm going to hold off for the holiday season when we go through that month of a podcast drought. And now without further ado, let's get down to business. Here are the three shows currently trending that I think are worth a listen. I present to you this week's podcast power ranking. At the number three spot, we have Gallery of Lies. Here's a synopsis from the show page. For years, Helga Achenbach has been among the world's most successful art dealers. But with one treacherous move, he lands in prison. In season six of Chameleon, Gallery of Lies, host Bijan Steven sets out on the international trail of the most famous criminal you've never heard of. With unprecedented access to an ex-con, Bijan attempts to solve the riddle of who Helga really is and who he might become. I finally finished this one and yo, I am no longer on Team Helga. I was temporarily enamored with his ability to give zero forks and take all these big risks. But now I'm seeing the consequences and the real people he hurt. This series was a slow burn, but it definitely got super juicy in the third act. I highly recommend Gallery of Lies. At the number two spot, we have The Wedding Scammer. Here's a rundown from the show page. Have you ever been scammed? In The Ringer's first true crime podcast, host Justin Sales tracks down a mysterious figure who once wronged him. A man with a lot of aliases, a lot of failed businesses, and a trail of victims. Justin follows him through a sham media company, a series of ruined weddings, and beyond, trying to find answers. The police can't offer any help, but maybe he can. Episode one was outstanding. This was as entertaining as a really good trashy reality TV show, but still innovative with the format and storytelling. They haven't even gotten to the actual wedding scam part, and I'm already hooked. I'm really hoping they keep up the great work and I don't get scammed by the wedding scammer. And at the number one spot, we have The Dream Season 3. Here's a synopsis from the show page. Past seasons of this award-winning investigative podcast looked at pyramid schemes and the world of wellness. This season, we're getting to know the gurus and life coaches who claim they know the secret to living our best lives. Is it all in our mindset or our privilege? Or are we all under a spell? This latest one was my favorite episode of the season so far. Jane Marie at her best. She managed to stay on task and formed a good balance of her personal life with the nitty gritty investigation. And I am living for the dream season three. Now for my miss of the week. We have Folktown. Here's a summary from the show page. Welcome to Folktown, the podcast that delves into the enigmatic, eerie, and enthralling stories from the heart of small towns, where whispers echo louder than secrets. Join your hosts, Amanda, Dina, and Dayel, as they guide you through the mysterious, thrilling world of Folktown each week. 
Yeah, this show is an example of why I choose not to have co-hosts. To avoid all the unnecessary chit-chat. It's definitely not because I don't have any friends, okay? Seriously, though, this one could be good if it was pared down, more organized, focus, maybe had one less host. As it stands now, though, Folktown and all three of its narrators are going down my podcast queue trapdoor. Find out next week if The Dream Season 3 will remain in the number one spot as the series concludes or if a new show will swoop in and take its place. Let me know what trending shows are in your top three and what show fell through your podcast queue trapdoor. I will meet you back here next week to dust off another superb true crime show from the archive for your next feeding fix. That's all for today's true crime feed. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I post links to my top three favorite shows of the week and bring you fabulous visual aids for every episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to join the conversation. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and tell your fellow partners in crime to tune in to True Crime Feed. Thanks for riding along and allowing me to be your audio accomplice. Join me next week for another feeding.